these figures. Um, but um, I will I will introduce it um, uh, anyway. So in panel A, I'm showing uh, the concept a conceptual model of the earthquake cycle, the, the derived from uh, laboratory experiments uh, by Onaka. Um, in the 1980s. Just, um, just a second. Okay. I think yeah, uh, we're still seeing the first slide. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, sorry, let me reshare to see if that is all. Uh, oh, yeah. Is that okay now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, here in panel A, um, we have this uh, conceptual model of the earthquake cycle uh, that was developed mostly uh, by uh, Mikia Suonaka. And, um, and uh, in panel B, I am showing uh, this uh, same earthquake cycle in terms of stress versus displacement on a given fault. And in panel C, I am showing uh, the evolution of uh, the sleeping patch on the fault here in the hatched area uh, as a function of time in the vertical axis and distance along the fault. So basically everything that's inside the lines is what is uh, sleeping. So this first green phase is basically the interseismic phase uh, where the tectonic loading builds up uh, on the fault in a quasi-elastic manner um, until we reach a given state of uh, stress where the fault will uh, start uh, to slip slowly. And uh, at least in the laboratory, what's observed is that uh, there is this uh, patch of slip that uh, will grow uh, with time until it reaches uh, the critical nucleation length. And at that point, uh, the fast rupture can nucleate, uh, allowing for a very large uh, stress drop and uh, very large co-seismic slips. Um, finally, when the rupture runs out of energy, uh, it will arrest and uh, this cycle uh, can repeat again. So of course, not everything is as simple as in this cycle, but I think it's a good uh, conceptual model. So uh, from this cycle, I will be mainly defining two two main phases uh, here in uh, in bluish, uh, which is the nucleation phase, and uh, in a red color, which is the propagation phase. Okay, so the nucleation phase occurs at uh, slow slip velocities, and uh, the propagation uh, at very fast ones. So um, I wanted to introduce uh, the current debate on on the nucleation phase and. Uh, mainly what, what is observed uh, from natural observations and also in some uh, laboratory experiments um, and is presented here uh, in terms of distance along the fault versus time. So again, everything that's inside the lines is sliding. And this is a model presented by, um, by uh, McClaskey in, in 2019. So basically there are two member models uh, for how an earthquake starts. Uh, the pre-slip model here in panel A, where basically this expanding a seismic slip front uh, that will reach eventually a critical nucleation size um, is uh, growing in, in size and uh, propagating in time. And this will be triggering foreshocks um, uh, that could be detectable um, in, in, in a natural setting. Then the other uh, end member model is the cascade model, where basically the four shocks will be triggering one another until one of them ignites uh, the main shock uh, rupture. And uh, McClaskey has proposed uh, that uh, the, the, there could be a mix between these two processes, where indeed this growing a seismic slip patch uh, could be triggering four shocks, but um, uh, if the conditions are just right, one of them may ignite uh, the main shock before the seismic slip front uh, reaches the, the critical nucleation length. So uh, today there's no global consensus um, um, as to how earthquakes start. And uh, mainly this is based on the fact that natural observations uh, show very <laughs> different um, uh, initiation phases. Uh, for example, here on the left-hand side, I am showing examples of the Izmit earthquake and of the Hector Mine earthquake, where uh, the others uh, computed the changes of stress uh, from the four shocks preceding these, these two main shocks, and they see that the radius of influence of each of the four shocks uh, seem to be triggering the next one until they trigger the main shock. Then on the right hand side of this slide, I am showing um, observations that are rather consistent with the pre-slip model. Uh, for example, here uh, for the Tohoku Oki earthquake, uh, they see this uh, uh, migration of foreshocks over, over distance and with, and with an acceleration over time. 
uh, a few weeks before the, the, the main foreshock and, and then the main shock. Then there was a seismic quiescence phase. Uh, finally, a large uh, uh, foreshock occurred here, the yellow star, uh, which triggered a bunch of faster shocks and finally ended up triggering uh, the magnitude nine earthquake. Um, for example, here in the lower uh, part of the slide, I am also showing uh, um, uh, an observation that could be consistent with the Priestley model uh, of the Iquique earthquake, where the authors resolved uh, with uh, geodesy and, and seismicity um, an eighth month long, long uh, aseismic, uh, pre seismic uh, split front uh, that was triggering intense seismicity. Uh, this resulted in uh, again in a very large foreshock and finally uh, in the in the magnitude 8.1 uh, uh, main shock. So with this, I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, natural earthquakes never start in the same way, and we can wonder why. So I hopefully will show you uh, from the laboratory uh, some insights into why no two earthquakes start in the same manner. Then regarding the propagation phase, so when the fault is sliding at very high uh, velocities, uh, it has been shown uh, mostly by uh, rotary shear experiments and, and laboratory earthquakes um, that when uh, slip velocities uh, increase because the stresses on the fault are, are very high, there's a lot of temperature that's generated. And so, uh, for example, here I am showing uh, some figures from the work of Aharon Novin Schultz. Uh, in the left-hand side, uh, you can see the increase of temperature uh, with increasing uh, sliding velocity in this type of uh, experiments and, and also some models that, that they run. And you see that uh, when the sliding velocities start to approach a few centimeters per second, you can reach temperatures higher than 1,000 degrees Celsius, which would melt uh, your rock and lubricate your faults and allow for very uh, large propagation. Um, this is also translated in terms of friction versus the slip velocity. Uh, you can see that the friction uh, across the fault surfaces is high uh, at low sliding velocities, but at, uh, at a few centimeters per second, uh, this friction is drastically reduced. And so uh, earthquakes could propagate uh, at very long uh, distances because of the, the resistance that is suppressed by thermal uh, mechanisms. So two of the main uh, dynamic weakening mechanisms that have been invoked in the lit literature are the thermal pressurization mechanism, which basically accounts uh, for the fact that trapped fluids in the fault will heat up and will dilate um, at uh, faster rates than the, than the rock uh, can dilate. And this would reduce the effective normal stress on the fault and allow for very, uh, uh, very long propagations of the ruptures um, because uh, the strength is reduced. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am showing here the flash heating mechanisms with mechanism which accounts for the fact that uh, because the real area of contact in a rough um, interface is much smaller than the nominal area of contact, the stresses supported by those contacts uh, should be much higher uh, than the nominal stress applied on the fault. And so because these stresses are, are so high, as soon as we have a sliding velocity uh, between those contacts, uh, there is very high temperature that can be generated. And so these contacts will melt very quickly uh, when uh, sliding starts. So um, something that has uh, rarely uh, been studied uh, for this weakening mechanism is, is, are the thermal interactions between the rock and the fluid. And uh, hopefully uh, I will show you from uh, some laboratory experiments that this uh, has a very uh, strong influence on the propagation phase of an earthquake. So with this uh, uh, short introduction, I, 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 this is the outline of my talk. I will first present you uh, some details on the experimental methods uh, that we used for these two studies. Then I will present you the results on the role of fluid pressure and earthquake nucleation. Uh, after that, um, on the propagation phase. And finally, I will, I will give you some conclusions. Um, so first of all, the experimental methods. Um, so what we did is that we did um, uh, we generated uh, laboratory earthquakes on westerly granite cylinders that you can see here in panel B. Uh, we prepared a weak interface here by uh, pre-cutting these, these samples at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical, and we imposed a constant fault roughness uh, in order to have a, a reproducible experiments. Um, 
uh, what's interesting about our study is that for the first time with fluids, we were able to uh, deploy a number of instruments uh, very close to the fault zone. So this is what's shown here in the map in panel A. Um, you can, uh, so this map, you should imagine it rolled around the sample. And so you can see the fault here with an S shape. Uh, these uh, gray circles are acoustic emission transducers in order to record um, the seismicity uh, coming from the fault uh, during the experiments. And we were also able to deploy a full bridge strain gauge here that basically measures uh, the differential strain uh, two millimeters away from the fault. Um, what's interesting is that uh, using the acoustic emission sensors, uh, we would trigger very fast recordings of the, of the strains uh, at the full bridge strain gauge. And uh, this gives us insights into the propagation phase. Uh, so the experiments were conducted under uh, conventional uh, triaxial stress conditions, so sigma two equals sigma three, and um, and uh, this confining pressure uh, was taken from forty five to ninety five megapascal in our experiments, and uh, the pore fluid pressure uh, was imposed uh, from zero to sixty megapascal. So this is what the, the sample looks like inside the triaxial apparatus. Uh, all these gold uh, cables um, are the acoustic emission sensors and the little wires you can see uh, maybe right here are the, the, the cables uh, that take the signal from the strain gauges and, and, and other instruments. So what we did here is that, uh, first of all, uh, we saturate the samples at very low confining pressures, as you can see here in panel A. Uh, once we reach uh, pressure and volume equilibrium at the, at the fluid pressure pumps on the top and the bottom of the sample, uh, we would load it uh, to the target confining pressure that would reproduce a given depth in the crust. Then we wait again for fluid uh, pressure and volume equilibrium at the pumps. And uh, we finally would load the samples actually um, at a constant um, displacement rate in order to generate these spontaneous uh, laboratory earthquakes. So in terms of the Merkulon diagram here shown in panel B, what we're doing is that basically we're increasing the sizes of the Merkulon circle of the, uh, of the more circles until we reach uh, the failure envelope. Um, and uh, this is important because there is a distinction between simulating this type of tectonic loading um, and what would be expected for, uh, for example, for anthropogenic activities where you would inject uh, fluids into a fault and that would shift uh, the more circles towards uh, the left uh, rather than increasing their size. So for now, we only focus on the influence of fluid pressure uh, at constant fluid pressure, but uh, with increasing tectonic loading for our uh, laboratory earthquakes. Uh, so this is what our experiments typically look like. Uh, here in panel A, I am presenting the evolution of uh, near fault shear stress versus time. Uh, note that the time here is in seconds. And uh, this is uh, recorded um, at, the, at the strain gauges at a sampling rate of 100 hertz. So you can see uh, this very clear uh, interstellar seismic phase, and then we have the nucleation uh, that is hidden somewhere here, uh, the stress drop, and then uh, these, these earthquake cycles that repeat. So from these recordings at low sampling frequency, uh, we define the static stress drop, which is basically the, the difference between uh, the, the quasi-static strength of the fault uh, here tau zero, and uh, the new state of stress where the fault reloads elastically again. So it's basically the difference in stress between two uh, static um, uh, states of the fault. So now if we look if we, if we look at the zoom on this uh, on one laboratory earthquake, again in terms of near fault shear stress versus time. Uh, so here in panel B, the time is in microseconds this time, and the sampling frequency is of 10 megahertz, so 10 million samples per second. Um, this was recorded at the strain gauges. And basically what we see is that once we reach the, the quasi-static strength of the fault uh, here to zero, uh, the stress uh, rises to a peak and then drops uh, to a minimum uh, dynamic value before uh, slowly healing until reaching a new static uh, stress uh, state again. And uh, from these recordings, we will define the uh, dynamic or breakdown stress drop, which is mainly the difference between the peak and the minimum value of stress uh, during the dynamic uh, propagation phase. 
so what's important is that um, for the first time in the presence of fluids, we were uh, able to record a very fast sampling frequencies, the evolution of stress very close to the fault. Um, so these are the, the experimental methods. And now I will present you um, uh, some insights on the, on the role, role of fluid pressure and earthquake nucleation. So uh, for now at low uh, sliding velocities. So um, here I will present you two experiments conducted at 70 megapascal effective confinement, uh, but one, uh, so the red box is under dry conditions, so no, no fluid pressure and nominally dried samples, and uh, the blue box is uh, with one megapascal per fluid pressure, so at 71 confinement and one megapascal uh, fluid pressure. And in this uh, fairly complicated uh, figures. What I'm showing is uh, in black, the evolution of shear stress versus the time to the main shock. So here at time zero, uh, the main shock occurs with the stress drop that you can see right here. In red and in a logarithmic uh, scale, I am presenting the slip uh, result on the fault uh, again uh, before the main shock. And finally, uh, the additional axis right here are the acoustic emission hits that we recorded um, prior to the main shock. Um, so what we see is that under dry conditions, we have an exponential evolution of the slip uh, up until the main shock. And this exponential evolution of slip is accompanied by an exponential uh, increase in acoustic emissions. Uh, on the other hand, under uh, pore fluid pressure conditions, uh, we see that the slip first evolves exponentially and then at a time around five seconds before the main shock, it switches to a power low evolution of time up until the main shock. Um, in this and in all the experiments with uh, pore fluid pressure, uh, the precursory phase was silent, meaning that we did not record any acoustic emissions uh, when uh, pore fluid pressure, uh, any four shocks when uh, pore fluid pressures were present, and we were only able to record uh, the main shocks. So um, with this, I wanted to show that uh, slightly changing uh, the presence of fluids or not in a fault can drastically change the precursory slip and seismicity uh, preceding a main shock. So this is uh, uh, another marker of, of, uh, of precursory activity could be the fault coupling. So basically the fault coupling is, de is uh, defined as the ratio between a reference sliding velocity uh, when the fault is almost fully coupled uh, versus the velocity of the fault uh, over time. So this is what's shown here again for these two same experiments that I presented you before. And uh, this time each curve is one, um, uh, earthquake cycle, and uh, the darker curves are uh, experiments that occurred later on the same sample. And what we can see is that um, in the under dry conditions, uh, the, the first uh, experiments uh, did not uncouple up until a few seconds uh, before the main shock. And as the fault maturity was increasing, uh, the, the, um, exper the uh, faults started to uncouple earlier and earlier uh, before the main shock, reaching here at around 20 seconds before the main shock. On the other hand, under uh, pore fluid pressure conditions, we see that uh, all the all the faults started to uncouple at around 30 seconds before the main shock, and there's not no really an influence of uh, the fault maturity on the way the fault uncouples uh, before the main shock. So. Um, uh, with these two uh, th these two types of figures that I just showed you, I wanted to to show that uh, the temporal evolution of earthquake precursors, so the slip, the seismicity, and the fault coupling, can drastically change with fluid pressure and also with slip history. Um, it seems also to be the case from previous experiments uh, uh, with uh, stress, uh, the stress state of the fault, and uh, maybe even with the fault roughness, um, as has uh, been presented in the work by Professor Gogol. Um, nevertheless, uh, we see that all these precursors can drastically change with pore fluid pressure, but uh, there is a very interesting observation uh, of a relation between the precursory moment and the co-seismic moment, um, so the total amounts of moments released uh, prior, uh, prior and during the main shock. So what I'm showing here in panel B is um, 
the evolution of the unfold shear stress versus the fold slip. Uh, we corrected every event uh, for the uh, elastic uh, deformation. And so you see that here, the stress versus slip starts in a vertical manner. And then we have this precursory slip until the, the peak value of stress. And finally, uh, we have the co-seismic uh, phase. And so basically what we defined as the precursory and co-seismic moments are uh, the precursory slip and co-seismic slip multiplied by the area of the fold that was sliding and the shear modulus. And so if we look at the values, the total uh, moments um, here, uh, the precursory is in the vertical uh, axis and uh, the co-seismic in the horizontal one, we see that no matter the fluid pressure uh, or dry conditions uh, in our experiments, uh, there seems to be a trend uh, between these two values. And um, compiling data from other experimental setups from other uh, research groups, we can see that these empty points also seem to fall in a, in a similar uh, scaling uh, relationship. So this is very promising because, um, because th there's, there's many implications uh, that I will come back to, uh, but this scaling between the precursory moment and the, and the co seismic moment is, is very promising. So we wanted to check if uh, how this works in uh, natural cases. So of course, there are very few observations uh, of the precursory moment released in natural cases um, uh, that can be resolved uh, that, that are resolving the seismic slip. When, but when it was possible, uh, we can see in these uh, black squares that they seem to fall in the same trend as uh, the one of our laboratory experiments that you can see here on the bottom of this plot. Of course, this is a log scale <laughs> with many uh, decades <laughs> in, in scale, but we see that uh, the observations from the lab are very consistent uh, with uh, observations of uh, natural earthquakes. Then I wanted to show these two stars uh, where the precursory moment of these earthquakes was resolved only from the, from the addition of the foreshocks that preceded those earthquakes. And we see that the precursory moment is widely underestimated with respect to our observations. Um, and so this uh, highlights the fact that uh, considering a seismic slip uh, for the total precursory moment is a very important um, uh, to observe uh, this, this trend, right? Um, this has been, uh, so this importance of uh, the seismic slip in the precursory moment uh, has been observed in the work by Dresden and colleagues uh, in the laboratory, where they show that the acoustic, the acoustic emission um, uh, moment release is very small compared to the aseismic uh, slip moment release in the laboratory. And it uh, seems that in natural earthquakes, so here in the work of Caballero and colleagues for the Valparaiso earthquake, it seems that aseismic pre-seismic displacement can reach at least 50% uh, of the total pre-seismic displacement in nature. So this takes me to the conclusions on, on this uh, Apart from the nucleation phase, um, we saw that uh, very slight changes in pore fluid pressure drastically changes the, the temporal evolution of foreshocks and precursory slip on our laboratory faults. Um, nevertheless, uh, in the laboratory, the precursory moment seems to scale with the co seismic moment release independently of the experimental conditions. And uh, this seems to be the case in several natural earthquakes as long as we consider a seismic slip in the um, in the um, precursory uh, moment released. Um, so now I will uh, show you some results on the role of fluid pressure on, uh, on the propagation phase this time. So I am presenting uh, very similar experiments, and this time I will presenting uh, I will be presenting three different experiments. So the same dry experiment uh, shown here in terms of uh, stress versus time. Um, uh, conducted at 70 megapascal effective confinement, then uh, a low pore fluid pressure experiment at one megapascal uh, effective confinement, uh, so, sorry, eff uh, effective pressure uh, and 71 megapascal uh, confinement in order to have comparable effective confinements, and uh, one experiment conducted at 25 megapascal pore fluid pressure, so here in black. Uh, so, first of all, what we can see is that the strength of the faults are uh, drastically reduced uh, by the inclusion of, uh, of pore fluid pressures. Uh, but even uh, between the two uh, pore fluid pressure experiments, which are conducted at the same effective uh, confinement, uh, we see very different behaviors. 
So if we take a look at uh, the static stress drops as was defined in the, in the, in the methods here at, uh, seen at low sampling frequency versus the total co-seismic slip, we see that uh, the dry experiment had the largest, largest static stress drops and largest co-seismic slips. The hyper pressure experiments had the smallest ones and the low pressure experiment had an intermediate behavior with very low uh, static um, uh, stress drops, but very large uh, total cost seismic slips. So this is a very intriguing behavior. And uh, to, to look a bit more into the detail of the mechanics of this, uh, we look at the, the um, uh, high frequency recordings of uh, the stress versus time. And so this time we can uh, look at the dynamic or, or the breakdown stress drop if you want. So uh, this is what's presented here in panels B, C, and D. Uh, again, here, uh, each curve is of one uh, propagation uh, phase, so one, one laboratory earthquake. And uh, I am stacking all the dry experiments here in B, uh, all the low pressure experiments in C, and the high pressure experiment in D. And you can see that uh, the dynamic or the breakdown stress drop was very large uh, in dry conditions and very small under uh, high pressure conditions here in black. And you see that for the low pressure conditions, so when we had very large co-seismic slips, the dynamic um, stress drop is very large, whereas the static stress drop is, uh, remains uh, fairly small. And so if we compile this in the same plot I showed you before, this time uh, the dynamic stress drops are the full symbols. Uh, you can see that the dynamic stress drops of the low pore pressure case were even larger than in the dry case. And this uh, is consistent with the fact that they had a very large uh, co-seismic slips. So to try to understand why we had these very large uh, magnitude laboratory earthquakes uh, under dry conditions and low pore pressure conditions, but no, not at high pore pressure conditions, we look at the microstructures of our faults. So this is what is shown here. Uh, panel A shows a scanning electron microscope image of the initial uh, fault surfaces so without any um, frictional sliding on them. And you can see this very homogeneous uh, roughness on, on the samples, uh, which was uh, very reproducible and, and we did measure before all of the experiments. Then uh, panel B shows uh, the microstructures of the dry experiment, and you and we found uh, many of these uh, ropey-like structures uh, stretched in the sense of shear of sizes uh, around 20 by 20 micron, uh, which are evidence of melting of the contacts um, at the surfaces uh, during the experiments. In the low pore pressure case, we were also able to find uh, these patches of melt and had a similar size as those in the dry experiment. But in the high pore pressure case, it was impossible to find any evidence of melting, and most of the surface was covered by uh, rock debris and, and gouge. Uh, so these evidence is that under dry conditions and low pore pressure conditions, uh, the flash heating mechanism was, was activated and explains the very large uh, magnitude earthquakes that we had due to dynamic weakening. But in the high pore pressure case, uh, it was not the case. So to further understand why this was happening, uh, we um, run this uh, analytical model of the temperatures reached at the asperity contacts. So um, this is what is shown here in panel A, uh, the, the, the schematic of this rough uh, contact uh, that are surrounded by fluids. Uh, we model this as circular asperities uh, here in gray, surrounded by a volume of fluid that interacts thermally with them. And uh, we compute uh, the temperature elevation at these asperities as the difference between a heat source rate, basically the product of shear stress at the contact times uh, the sliding velocity. And we subtract a temperature buffering term uh, due to the volume of fluid that interacts with the asperity. And what's uh, novel about our study is that we included the dependence of pressure and temperature of the thermophysical properties of uh, the fluid. So basically the density and the specific heat of the fluid will depend on uh, the pressure and temperature states uh, that we impose. So this is what is shown here. Um, this is the equation that we used for the uh, temperature elevation. Uh, and again, um, I am showing uh, the color coded curves, uh, this time for the flash temperature here in panel A versus uh, the slip during the lifetime of the asperity. Uh, and panel uh, C and D show the evolution of uh, density and specific heat with increasing temperature. 
And what we can see is that under dry conditions, as soon as we reach velocities of a few uh, centimeters per second, uh, we can reach uh, the melting temperature of the rock. So here at 1000 degrees Celsius during the lifetime of the asperity. Um, under uh, low pore pressure conditions, so the blue curves that are hidden here at the beginning by the black curves, uh, we can see that uh, the temperature elevation is buffered uh, by the fluid until we can reach the vaporization of water at one megapascal, and then we lose this heat buffering effect and uh, the rock can again reach the melting temperature uh, um, during its lifetime. And finally, under hyper pressure conditions, so the black curves, we can see that the temperature is buffered during the whole lifetime of the asperity, and we cannot pass uh, this temperature, which, which corresponds to the liquid to supercritical transition temperature of the water at high pore fluid pressure, so at 25 megapascal. And this is mainly due to the fact that the liquid to supercritical transition um, uh, Makes, makes it that the specific heat of water sees a peak, a very strong peak, an, an increase of more than 2,000% uh, at uh, the transition. And this makes this heat buffering effect extremely efficient and doesn't allow melting of uh, the rock, um, of the rock uh, asperities. Can I ask a quick question, Matteo? Yes, sure. Um, did you check how sensitive these results are to your A, this... Yes. So, how, <laughs> the, uh, so I think the buffering zone is, yeah. So yes. Um, word I, I, uh, I, we did that. I have a slide, I think. Uh, so we, we varied the A uh, from two microns uh, to 200 microns. And the results I was showing before is of 20 microns. Uh, we, and basically the 20 microns that I showed before is uh, the sizes of the patches that we found from the microstructures. But we see that uh, in many cases, uh, even at ve for very small asperities, uh, we still can reach uh, the melting temperature uh, of, the, um, of the rock um, at high sliding velocities, so one, at one meter per second, uh, which are velocities that could be expected uh, during the propagation phase. Um, so there is a sensitivity uh, to the to the diameter of the, of the of the fault and to the volume that interacts thermally with it, but uh, across almost uh, three orders of magnitude in uh, in um, in size, uh, it seems to to be operating. Um, so these mechanisms seem to be operating. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, this is the, these results of our model are very consistent uh, with our observations of the microstructures and also uh, of the mechanics, and uh, we still uh, need to needed to understand a bit um, why the the dynamic friction was lower in the low pore fluid pressure conditions than in dry conditions um, in our experiments. Uh, and so to do this, I will not go into the details, but uh, we run uh, some models of the thermal pressurization mechanism. And uh, we see that the friction drops um, explained by uh, thermal pressurization are exactly consistent with uh, the difference in friction between the dry and low pore fluid pressure experiment, and also explain the friction drop in high pore fluid pressure uh, experiments. So uh, what we came up with uh, and, and this is the main conclusion of, of the influence of fluid pressure on the propagation phase, is that under dry conditions, the main uh, weakening mechanism is the flash heating mechanism. Um, under high uh, pore fluid pressure conditions, uh, flash heating is inhibited by this thermal buffering effect, uh, and most of the friction drop can be explained by uh, thermal pressurization mechanism. And finally, uh, under uh, low pore fluid pressure conditions, we have we seem to have a combination of the two. Uh, so uh, the when the fluid vaporizes, it will dilate and will uh, uh, give rise to uh, uh, thermal pressurization. And also when it vaporizes, it uh, this heat buffering effect disappears, allows the rock to melt, and leads to very uh, large drops in friction and very large uh, propagation of the earthquakes. So with this, I, I think the main message I wanted to convey here is that um, uh, fluid thermodynamics cannot be neglected in physics-based models of earthquake rupture because they affect uh, these uh, dynamic weakening mechanisms. 
So <laughs> this takes me to, to uh, the general con conclusions of, uh, of, uh, of this presentation. Um, I hope to have shown you that uh, laboratory studies uh, can help understanding uh, novel earthquake physics under a repeatable and safe environment. Um, I showed you that uh, very small changes in fluid pressure can drastically change, first of all, earthquake precursors, the sleep, seismicity, and fault coupling and uh, can also drastically change the cost seismic slip due to strong thermal interactions between the fluids and the, and the fall core. And in this, uh, in this uh, sense, uh, fluid thermodynamics can have very uh, large influence on uh, the propagation phase. Um, uh, going a bit further in, into the interpretation, uh, we saw that uh, our laboratory observations are, are very consistent with a pre-slip model um, uh, and I will refer you to, to the article for, for details on this, but we see this exponential acceleration of the foreshocks and the press slip under dry conditions. Uh, and this uh, makes us think that, that uh, in the laboratory, at least uh, the pre slip model seems to be uh, rather systematic. Um, we also uh, showed that uh, fluid pressure uh, can explain why no two earthquakes start in the same way. Um, it, since changing very slightly the pore fluid pressure uh, drastically changes the initiation phase. And this is the case also for stress, uh, fault roughness, and many other parameters. So uh, really it is not surprising <laughs> that uh, we are not able to find a general um, initiation procedure uh, for uh, natural earthquakes. Um, finally, uh, we saw that the, this um, scaling relationship between the precursory and the coast seismic moment um, is clear in laboratory earthquakes, and it could be uh, the case for some natural earthquakes. So if this relation uh, was uh, confirmed, uh, it would be very helpful uh, to, to estimate uh, a minimum expected earthquake magnitude. So if uh, we were able to monitor in real time an seismic slip front, uh, we, uh, and, and estimate the, the moment that is being released, we could estimate in real time uh, what would be an expected earthquake magnitude, if this works. Of course, this is a big if. Uh, and uh, I think that um, much more constraints on the temporal and spatial evolution of this precursory sleep are needed uh, in order to try to confirm this. And this is what I'm working on uh, here at Caltech uh, currently. Uh, and finally, um, I showed you that the fluids can be an extremely efficient heat buffer. And so, um, again, I insist on the fact that uh, Earthquake rupture models uh, need to include uh, these thermodynamic uh, effects of the fluid, so the thermal interactions between the fluids and the rock uh, during dynamic rupture. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attentions and and for your attention, and I will take any questions uh, that you might have. Okay, thank you, Matteo. That was a really excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have, I actually have a ton of questions, but I don't know if Kieran is here. We should probably let the students go first and ask a couple of questions. Oh, let me see my camera. Something. And then, you know, I can hold off a little bit. Let's see if the students have any questions. Or Kieran, you're the moderator. I don't want to take yeah. away from you, but there was, there was a bit of a silence. So I thought I'd jump in. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, I have one question, like uh, in the first, I think second or third slide you compared, you saw a plot where there is a you saw effect of uh, uh, pore, uh, fluid pressure and dry sample with uh, rate of uh, acoustic, emission, acoustic emission. Yes. Yeah, this, this one. Panel. Yeah. So in the second one, uh, in the second panel, uh, where you have like there is no to very like uh, less a, a is before like just before the slip, mm -hmm. right? That is what it means, right? In the yes. bottom panel B. So is it because that there is no heat uh, generation that there is no melt, so that's why there is no precursory or like uh, precursory A is before uh, the s before it slips for the pore pressure. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's a that's a very good question and uh, 
I don't uh, have a conclusive answer uh, for you. Um, so the, the fact that uh, we have this thermal buffer effect uh, that is kind of uh, delaying the, the main rupture, the, the main rupture acceleration, because it's hindering the flash heating mechanism, could possibly be uh, the, the, the reason why we don't observe acoustic emissions. Unfortunately, uh, we have no way of proving that because uh, the microstructures, for example, uh, were taken only after the, the, the experiments. The, so the large stick slip events occurred. And, and so we cannot really compare uh, the microstructure during the precursory phase for, for the two different types of experiments, right? Um, so this is, this is a, a, an issue we have here, um, but I think so. We, we did not come up with a, with, a, with a clear physical explanation as to why we don't have four shocks in the, in the poor pressure case. But what I wanted to show is mostly that uh, the precursory phase can drastically change uh, just by slightly changing the presence or not of fluids, right? And, um, and yeah, I think it's, um, I've, ha I've had, had many thoughts about <laughs> why uh, we don't have four shocks uh, with with pore fluid pressures, and uh, I I don't really have a conclusive answer for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. And the next question or or the query is like in the next slide, the, where we yeah. discuss about uh, yeah this one. Mm -hmm. So here you we discuss about fault maturity for dry and uh, fluid uh, injected sample, and you may. I think in this slide you talk about coupling and decoupling. Yes, right. Yes. So, how does it exactly affect uh, that precursory signals? Um, so the, this uh, fault coupling is resolved basically from the derivative of the slip. So it's uh, pretty close to what I was uh, showing before, um, and uh, and so it's it's very closely related to the acceleration of the slip, right? Um, but uh, what the, the idea here was to show that um, in, in for different uh, fall maturities and for different pore fluid pressure conditions, the initiation is never similar. And so uh, there's many, there have been many um, studies of, uh, of geodetic observations of fault coupling in, in, in real faults that uh, try to relate, uh, you know, this fault on coupling uh, to an eventual earthquake that will occur, and there is no no real consensus on it. And so, what we are showing here is that even in very controlled conditions in the laboratory, uh, very re almost very reproducible uh, conditions, uh, we still have uh, these very different initiation phases and these very uh, different uncoupling evolutions uh, toward the main shock. Yeah, right. and this is actually a really interesting question, right? My my feeling is from what we have observed, usually the, these acoustic emission foreshocks um, tend to be a byproduct of this sort of uh, mainly a seismic preparatory phase. Mm -hmm. um, so you show that this preparatory phase seems to be more pronounced for the higher uh, um, PF, the, the fluid pressure, yet you have more foreshocks for the dry. So usually yeah. what we see, if we have an extended uh, precursory phase, let's say you start to slip slowly and accelerates, that tends to be also associated with a lot more AEs at, in terms of numbers of AEs at least. Yes. Whereas the dry yes. samples, and you showed that too, right? Your dry experiment seems to be almost linear all the way up to the very end. And then you just have this very last little bit of nonlinearity and then also associated with AEs. Um, yes. That, that, it's interesting. I, I'm also puzzled by the lack of AEs for the fluid pressure experiment. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I can totally understand that. And so there, there is the possibility that um, the fluid, the, the, the having the fluid pressure attenuates uh, the signals and not so the, the small signals of the AEs enough so that we cannot record them. But in any case, uh, it, it it is physically attenuating uh, the, the the IA waves, right? So the the, the foreshock uh, waves, and uh, this uh, would 
still be the case in a natural setting where you have a fault with pore fluids compared to a fault uh, that is dry, right? And uh, then, of course, in, in, in your work, um, the, um, what, what matters is not only the number of AEs, but also their size, right? And so if their size was much smaller in the case of uh, pore fluid pressure experiments, uh, it might go below our det detection level. What's important is that we are using the same detection level uh, in the same amplification uh, in, the, in, in all the experiments uh, I've presented here. So it seems to be a, a, a physical mechanism rather than an artifact uh, introduced by the, the recording setup since we are using the exact same setup in all the experiments, right? But it is a very puzzling observation. It's possible that it's because um, these uh, microscopic asper uh, asperities cannot melt uh, with fluids before the, the main rupture uh, nucleates. So before you have a, a very fast uh, sliding velocity that allows the vaporization of water, for example. Uh, but it is the case for all our pore fluid pressure experiments. So that, that is a, a big possibility, just that we were not able to, <laughs> to yeah. consistently show it. <laughs> it looks like we should come up with some standardized AE sensors for all of the labs so we can actually compare what we're measuring. Because yeah. exactly what you said, who knows, right? It's, it, everybody has their own kind of manufactured sensors and who knows what the sensitivity and frequency ranges, et cetera. Yeah. That, that would sort of probably address what you were saying. Is it just recording sensitivity? What's the actual size? Or is it some, some other um, physical difference in the creation of the AEs? Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think that um, so the work that has been done in the last few years uh, with the calibration of uh, acoustic emission sensors uh, helps going through the, through that uh, comparability. Right. Uh, unfortunately, for these experiments, uh, I was, uh, we, we were not able to, to have calibrated sensors. Um, but again, what, what I wanted to insist is on the fact that all these experiments that I'm presenting here and that I'm comparing here, um were run with the exact same setup so with the same sensor and the same configuration with the same amplification same sensitivity so at least <laughs> among these experiments i think i think it's comparable right but it, it would be great if we were able to compare with uh, the experiments you've run and other groups too because that, that i think is a it's a very a big flaw of the experimental <laughs> works yeah. uh, that we cannot compare Oh. Uh, hi, um, I had a question about your uh, strain measurement. Um, what, what do you think is causing the, um, the high frequency uh, oscillations before a slip event occurs in your, um, your strain signals? Um, so I guess you mean, uh, sorry, um, these high frequency oscillations right here. Um, are you seeing my screen? Sorry. Ah, uh, yes, there it is. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, yeah, it, it looks like it oscillates. And, and one of your uh, your um, parameters, that tau sub p, uh, seems to depend on how far it oscillates before the the slip actually occurs. Mm -hmm. So um, I I, uh, I so I think there's two parts. Uh, to that question. So uh, can you see these uh, slides right here? Um, so basically this, when the, the, the stress is, uh, let's call it quasi-static. So when we're at the tau zero uh, level of stress, uh, these uh, slight oscillations are mainly due to the, to the noise in the recording basically. Um, but uh, these peaks that we see right here, uh, are very uh, uh, real values. And uh, there's been several explanations uh, for, for these peaks. Uh, one uh, is that uh, these peaks correspond to the direct effect uh, in, a, in a rate and state sense of friction uh, to the direct effect. So basically, if you have a jump in velocity, uh, your fault will strengthen and then will drop uh, to a residual value of uh, friction, right? So this could be one of the explanations. And the other one is that uh, this peak is due to the stress amplification at the tip of the crack. 
So basically, when you have a rupture that's propagation, you have a, a stress intensity at its tip. And this is what we are seeing here. And I would favor uh, um, this explanation more than the direct effect in rate and state, uh, mainly due to the very high frequencies uh, that, so the, the very high sampling rates that we are using here um, uh, that uh, would allow us um, uh, to see this uh, stress intensity at the tip of the crack. So it, this this is my explanation. I don't know if it's <laughs> satisfactory. Oh, okay. So um, so each one of those peaks is uh, one separate peak, or it, it doesn't go back and forth uh, with time. Uh, um, I mean, you have several. You have what five curves superimposed there? So it's kind of mm. hard to see what happens. Yeah, I, I've looked at them uh, in details, uh, and you really have. Uh, one or two data points that end up um, at, at the peak value. Uh, so that's uh, two for uh, 10 million samples per second. But then I think what's interesting and, and, and something that you cut up is that during uh, the, the dynamic weakening, so during the, the, the dynamic stress drop, you still have uh, increases and decreases uh, that are not only due to the noise in the in the recording right so this is what you can see here in the details for example um uh, can you see my mouse yes right yes I can. Uh, so for example this this little bump right here and uh i think this is this could be due to several things to so to the shape of the radiated waves that reach uh, the strain gauge uh it could also be due to um the breakage of different asperities in the fault that generate these uh, strange uh, stress profiles uh, during the dynamic weakening. Uh, but I, I, I don't really have a hard proof of, of any of this. So uh, it's, I think it's a very interesting field of research, but with the, um, with the setup such as it is set now, we cannot really um, have a, a, a strong conclusion on well, what this these oscillations during uh, the weekend are due to. This is more pronounced for the dry or for the for the wet samples with fluid pressure. This kind of roughness in your. Um, it's. I think it's more pronounced for the uh, wet samples, as you can see uh, in the blue curves. Of course, uh, here they are all superimposed, but I could find the those that are not. Um, uh, so it's it's more more pronounced. So this this bumpiness is more pronounced for the wet uh, experiments. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't, yeah. Again, I, I don't have a, a clear. Uh, <laughs> would it have been due to different disparities? Thing I would have almost guessed the opposite because I don't know. Somehow, the thing is, if you have fluid pressure in there and you load it, it's almost like. Uh, um, smoothening the fault stresses right across the context a bit con contact a bit. Um, yeah it could be but still the I, I guess the you know the high frequency radiation from the from the individual asperities that are breaking should not be very different um in the two cases right even though you, you smoothen a bit the, the stress fields, but at the contacts, uh, the stress is much, must be uh, much higher than at the, at the troughs, if you want. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I would expect that the high frequency radiation is not that different from the two. Um, I could look at the high frequency radiation from the acoustic emissions. That's something I did not do, but uh, it's a, I think it's a good uh, it's a good thing to do, yeah. Mm. I will I will give it <laughs> a bit more thought, but yeah, it's it's very interesting that they are different. Any more questions? Well, I I got a I got one. while the other ones are thinking um so i'm also quite intrigued by your observation with the precursory and slip and then the co-seismic slip scaling relation there um however i'm kind of wondering what the mechanism is that connects the two right because i think you were arguing for the there's a lot of 
uh, influence of melt production and flash heating, right, for the co-sizing moment, mm -hmm. that, that process should probably not be a, have any effect on, on the precursory slip, right? Because you're sliding very slowly in, isn't it? So do you have any guess what connects the two here? Uh, yeah, that's, a, again, a very <laughs> tough question. Um, so in the in the article, we came up with an explanation based uh, uniquely on uh, nucleation theory, uh, which uh, would result, uh, so if your fracture energy scales with the, if the fracture energy of, of, the, of the event scales with the slip, uh, we expect the scaling between uh, the precursory moment and the co-seismic moment. So this is what we came up with um, in the, uh, theoretically. But um, I did not I, I did not present that theory here first because of time uh, matters, but also uh, because um, after the years and after uh, discussing with a lot of people, uh, I agree with you that the fracture energy of the co-seismic should be drastically changed uh, by these weakening mechanisms, right? And uh, in that sense, it would not affect uh, the precursory uh, the precursory phase. Um, if you if you want, I, <laughs> I could uh, lead you through the the way we we came up with a theory that that predicts the scaling, but um, I I am doubting <laughs> myself on that uh, right now. Uh, I'm sure, I'd, I'd be curious to hear it. Yeah, we we have a lot of time later on, um, so maybe we can chat about that aspect then. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. In the in the figures um, where you had the uh, the zoom in, and you have a the stress drop versus time and you get that little overshoot and then after the overshoot yeah but the, the one you just went there yeah. you get a little overshoot and then there's a period of time when it's sort of constant and then it goes down again and then it starts like the post seismic recovery yeah what's going on in there <laughs> uh <laughs> you guys have very tough questions. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, the, the thing is that, is that this is occurring, if you see the time scale of that is around uh, 50 microseconds. And so uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to have an idea of the physical mechanism that is occurring there. Um, but uh, what I would expect is that the, in, in that uh, constant part right there, uh, the fault is sliding at a constant stress, right? So the rupture has unzipped uh, the fault and uh, the fault is sliding at a, at, a, at a constant level of stress. And then it runs out of energy at the end of, of that, um, of that uh, section and it starts to decelerate. Uh, and this is what you see here in the, in the recovery. Um, I is think there a dynamic overshoot there or... This is a little bit off the fall, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's two millimeters away from the fault, so there is a a, a decrease of the, I guess, the stress uh, overshoot with the distance of the fault. Um, uh, so we, there there seems to be dynamic overshoot. The issue is that we were not able to record the slip on the fault at very high sampling frequencies mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, now I think we are able to do it, uh, but at the time we were not able to do that. And so we could not see uh, this in terms of uh, stress versus uh, fast sleep. So we are not really sure uh, uh, the, the, of, about the evolution of sleep uh, during this phase. And that is the, the, I mean, I think the main caveat about uh, this study, uh, we could have done much more if we, we had the the fast evolution of sleep. But um, from my understanding of, of, of a rupture propagation and, and the sleep that accompanies it, uh, I would see this. So in, in, the, in this diagram, it would be this phase where uh, we, you have a co-seismic sleep uh, with uh, no real weakening anymore. So it, the stress drops and then you still have some co-seismic sleep that's going on. Um, again, it's a very good question and I don't have the hard proof of it. Uh, we've been working on, on the recording of uh, high frequency sleep and uh, now we're 
just starting to be able to have that. Um, so maybe in a few years, I, <laughs> I will be able to, to give you some insight on that. Uh, it's a great question. But... OK, thank you. OK, I, I think we are done with the questions. Thank you, Dr. Matthew, for uh, joining our series seminar series. And it, it, the talk was really insightful and detailed. Now we have uh, a chat in, individually with Dr. Matthew time. We have 15 minutes for each, for those who signed up. Uh, for other, I think we are done with today's seminar. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah. Alamgir? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it is Alamgir, Thomas, and me. So, uh, so we uh, join all along, or we should join like after 15 minutes on our individual time. Um, let, let's do it individually. Yeah. Um, but okay. here, um, if you want to connect early and listen in or something, by all means, you know, if, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll lock off for. Uh, a few minutes so I'll let Alamgir and Matteo chat. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll come back in a bit. Yeah. All right. See you soon. Yes. Right. So uh, you are the co-host. I think uh, should be fine if I leave, right? Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am co-host, so I guess you can join. Yeah. Yeah. See you later. See you soon. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.